Hello, everyone. I want to introduce myself uh, for those of you who don't know me. Oh, that was scary. I'm Jess Wilcox. I'm the programs coordinator here at the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art. Um, and I'm really excited to introduce this panel today. Um, I will resist with every inch and every breath, punk and the art of feminism, organized by AIR Gallery and the Women in Arts Collaborative at Rutgers University. Um, this is, I believe, our fifth year of um, collaborating with uh, these two organizations. We do it um, every March, which is one reason I look forward to March, uh, not because it's Women's History Month, since every month is Women's History Month at the Sackler Center, um, but because I get to work with these two great institutions. Um, so I won't go on. I'm going to uh, pass it over to the moderator of tonight's panel. This is the second uh, year in a row she's been moderating. Uh, we loved what she did last year and invited her back. So um, Leah Devon is a visual artist, historian, and associate perfecter, pro professor at, at Rutgers University. She has presented her work at numerous venues, including the Blanton Museum, the University of Southern California, One Archives Gallery and Museum, the Houston Center for Photography, the Leslie Lohman Museum, and MoMA PS1 Contemporary Art Center. And she has written for and been featured in Art Papers, Capricious, Wired, Feministing.com, GLQ, and Radical History Review, among other publications. She recently wrote an essay for public collectors and exhibited at a show based on her collection of teenage punk pen pal correspondences, which was featured in Art Forum Critics Picks last month. Without further ado, help me welcome Leah. So we want to thank Jess Wilcox and the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center here at the Brooklyn Museum first. Also AIR Gallery, Women in Arts Collaborative at Rutgers University, especially Connie Tell and Nick Yanazelli for, for all of their support. So having grown up at, surrounded by and involved in different punk communities, the kind of art and thought that we're focused on tonight is, is really some of the most meaningful for me. Ever since I, I got involved in punk when I was a teenager going to all ages shows in Olympia, Washington and Seattle, Washington, the kind of feminist art and collective action that were part of those communities ended up really being a defining experience for me. And I think it still, uh, to this day, shapes the way I think about my identity and my politics and, and my relationships. But when I was putting together this event and, and trying to think of something to say to introduce it, I, was, I had a really hard time because I think punk like being a feminist or, or being queer, is something that it, it's really hard to, to boil down to just a few sentences, like some, some common set of things that punks do or they think. Like punks can't even agree on the word punk. <laughs> um, and uh, so it's not so easy to, to write down a few sentences in a museum calendar or, or come up with a, an introduction or, or pick artists or pieces of work that, that encapsulate a movement. But luckily what we have here today are a group of really multi-talented, very smart people who just can't be categorized or, or simplified in any way. Whether they're making music, um, uh, touring around the world, uh, sleeping on people's couches while they show experimental videos in backyards and theaters and even roller skating rinks, <laughs> whether they're um, uh, making zines and images with great intelligence and urgency, or doing groundbreaking performances, doing groundbreaking performances while topless. <laughs> Those are the kind, of, uh, the kind of fearlessness, the kind of aesthetics, and the kind of activism that I want to see more of. So at, at a time now, I think, where, where punk is being <coughs> reimagined and, and, um, and revisualized in a lot of different ways, both in our institutions and outside of them, we're really happy tonight to have this group of people to showcase their uh, music, photography, <coughs> exhibitions, performances, so many different genres that they work in, and have them here in conversation together with us and with you in the audience to be able to talk about punk and feminism in this moment, especially now because, uh, as we've seen from their work and, and events around the globe lately, that, that 
punk and feminism still have a, a lot of power as a confrontational force um, against the uh, against uh, for confronting the status quo and all kinds of, um, of, of uh, voicing outrage for all the kinds of things out in the um, world that that um, that that we are making us so angry, as we've seen with, with Pussy Riot and some of the people who are working with them right now that we'll hear more about. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce all of our panelists in a row so I don't have to interrupt each one of them um, and we can just go ahead and let them go from here. So let me start with my first panelist, Lydia Lunch. Lydia Lunch. <laughs> Lydia Lunch is a passionate, confrontational, and bold body of work, really almost doesn't need an introduction. She's released too many musical projects to tally, has toured for decades, curated dozens of shows, written half a dozen books, and pioneered so much of what many of us do or, or aspire to do. She's presently touring Retrovirus, a retrospective of her decades-long musical output, and she'll release the LP, Urge to Kill, in June 2015. How Happening Gallery will present The War is Never Over, her first solo exhibition in America, which opens in May 2015. Narcissist sister works at the intersection of performance, dance, art, and activism. She's presented work at the New Museum, PS1, The Kitchen, MoMA, Abrams Art Center, and many nightclubs, galleries, and alternative art spaces. She's performed internationally um, at, at many venues and has uh, videos that have exhibited worldwide. Her video, The Self Gratifier, won my favorite, The Best Use of a Sex Toy at the 2008 New <laughs> Vibrations Film Festival, and Vaseline won the main prize in 2013. Interested in troubling the divide between popular entertainment and experimental art, Narcissist appeared on America's um, Got Talent in 2011. She's a recipient also of the 2015 Creative Capital Award. Astrid Suprak has curated exhibitions, screenings, and live music events and performances for art spaces, film festivals, and academic venues <coughs> internationally, including PS1, The Kitchen, um, I-Beam, Museo Rufino Tamayo, Europe Winter Center for the Arts, and Liverpool Biennial, um, as well as also non-art spaces, including the roller skating rinks that I was talking about. Uh, she's uh, previously the director and curator of the Carnegie Mellon Miller Gallery and Syracuse University's <coughs> Warehouse Gallery, as well as the Pratt Institute Film Series. Osa Etoy is the author and editor of Shotgun Seamstress, a zine and blog for, by, and about black punks, feminists, queers, musicians, artists, and activists. Osa is also an art teacher, a potter, a show promoter for girl bands, queer bands, and social justice fundraisers under the name No More Fiction. She was a maximum rock and roll columnist from 2009 to 11, has toured with the People of Color Zine Project, and she won the Printed Matter Award for Artists in 2009. She's also been in a bunch of bands, including the New Blood, which released an album on Kill Rock Stars in 2008. And then finally, we have musician and writer Johanna Feidman. She's a founding member of the feminist band La Tigra and co-owner of, co of the Siegel Salon in New York. Her publications and correspondence from the 1990s through the early 2000s are archived in the Riot Girl collection of New York University's Bales Library and Special Collections. She's a recipient of a 2014 Creative Capital Award from uh, Creative Capital and the Warhol Foundation, and her recent cultural criticism has been an art forum, <laughs> book forum, Art in America, and New Inquiry. And she's currently working on a book on radical feminist Andrea Dworkin. Okay, so let's just hand it over to Lydia, because I know she will just take off with it. So <laughs> thank you so much. Feminism. First of all, I never considered myself a punk. I'm no wave, and that is different than punk. I never made punk music. I made no wave music. I have more in common with the surrealist and the situationist. But the title of this panel was, With Every Breath I Resist, and I have always been fucking resisting. <laughs> My first inspiration to resist was when I was eight years old and I'm watching a black and white horror film in upstate New York in a black ghetto, one of three white families on the block, I felt quite at home in the horror show that was happening. And it was 1967 and the race riots broke out because Rochester, like 17 other cities in America, Cleveland, Detroit, Watts, etc., people were just sick of being bullshitted into the reality of this country where they're promised one thing and given another. So my house is the epicenter of the race riots of 67. Well, I'm watching a horror film, so there's horror outside and inside, and I'm living with a maniac who happens to be my father. Now, this to me is to be considered like a war zone. This is the American war zone. And when I heard those people walking down the street, now, Rochester, New York, which also bred uh, Kim Gordon, Wendy O. Williams, Emma Goldman spent time there, but Malcolm X and 
And Martin Luther King and Saul Alinsky also visited there. I don't know why, something in the water like fucking poison. Thank you very much. <laughs> it is the first super fun site. It is the first of 1,600 super fun sites. And yes, I have had cancer numerous times, but look at me, I'm just the picture of absolute health. That's in spite of it. It was at eight years old when I first got my first calling to protest because I saw people running down the streets and screaming, and this riot went on for three days. My house is the epicenter. A helicopter crash, 3,000 people are arrested. And what they're saying is, I'm black and I'm proud, and I won't fucking take it anymore. What the hell did I know? I'm eight years old. In that time, though, music was a music of protest. There was The Doors. There was Ball of Confusion by The Temptations. There was White Rabbit. There was a music of pro which to me was just the radio. You're disappearing into it. What do you know? Your father tells you, forget the riots, go to your room. Why? This to me is like a celebration. Now, I didn't remember until many years later that not only was I aware of the 1967 riots, but the same riots happened in 1964 when I was five years old. So from the time I was five to the time I was eight, I'm basically living in a war zone imagination, waiting for the next war to hit. And to me, I knew who the enemy was, because first of all, I'm living with the enemy. The enemy is my father. My father, at that point, was a door-to-door -door Bible salesman. He was a gambler, a drinker, and an asshole, and he's selling Bibles door-to-door. -door. Now, it was about at that point where I decided that God was, after all, dead, because my dad is selling him door-to-door. <laughs> So I had the enemy in the house, I had the enemy of war perpetrated by the patriarchy, and then I had God the fucker. So I knew from about the age of 12 what my goal was, and that was to take on this unholy trilogy. Hence my first book, so the word show was called Daddy Dearest, because I had to go after the enemy within, within my house. And from there, it just spread. I moved to New York where I ran away first at 14, and then I came here at 17. And I came here to do spoken word, but spoken word didn't exist then, really. I mean, it was no way, but it was 77. I mean, it was post-Lenny Bruce, it was post-Patty Smith and her rock and roll poetry, which was inspirational to me, but very too traditional. And, and it, it was not slam poetry. So I came and I wanted to do spoken word. Actually, Lenny Kay was the only person that listened to me. The rest of them would fucking run away. But he did listen, the guitar player for Patty Smith. And I decided, well, I'm gonna get my word out one way or the other, and if that means I have to use music, which I did, my first group, Teenage Jesus and the Jerks, what's interesting is half the music was instrumental. So what's the point? Well, it must be the title of the song, no? And that's, I guess, when my musical schizophrenia also began, because like many of us, I wear many hats. So I had to have a band that sounded like Teenage Jesus at the same time that I had a band that sounded like a slug crawling across a razor blade. The next band had to sound like a rock and roll. The next band had to sound like a big band. So I began in New York, which was at that point in 77, a bankrupt city on the edge of collapse, where everybody came just to like lose their mind. And as opposed to like the punk, what we think of punk like in England, in New York, punk then, although I was no way, was personal insanity, personified and thrown onto the stage. So I took it to the stage, and I kept taking it to the stage. And I was just talking to Lee, and she goes, what about stage fright? I said, look, the first time I took to the stage in Teenage Jesus, and I was walking up with a guitar, that I don't know how I managed to learn how to play, because I knew nothing about music, except it should sound really fucking ugly and go really hard, and contradict everything that inspired me. It's like I knew the minute I was walking to the stage, it was not my job to ever feel panicked, but to cause panic. As an articulate, intelligent woman who was against one of three things, God the Father, God the fucker, and God my own father in my house. And that has always been the trajectory that my art, music, and literature has taken a target at. Literature was my first inspiration, not music. Henry Miller, please go back and read Tropic of Capricorn, because I've been reading it again, and I just can't believe how good it is. I'm surprised I ever wrote a word. <laughs> So my whole point in ever speaking out was to speak against what I thought was the injustice. That is, uh, that is how to not be as we all are, no matter how we've been battered, whether it's a battery of economy or of nuclear family or of religion or of ideology or of sex or race. That how do you not become a victim that carries on the cycle of abuse? And I used my art to get through that. And I did films like Fingered and Right Side of My Brain and wrote my book Paradoxia in order to try to, because I knew I wasn't alone. What was interesting to me as a victim was, my details may have been specific, but trauma is universal. And somebody had to come out with a woman's voice of articulate aggression and using the enemy's language, put it right back in their fucking face. And that is basically what I'm still doing today, whether it's through literature, art, 
photography, music, illustrated work, or writer's workshops, because I think basically we as victims in this society of a country that is a mass murdering megalomaniac need to tell a different story to other people, need to be the voice in people's mouths that know they have a scream that they cannot articulate. And that's what I do. Thank you very much. I'm Lydia Rush. Humor and spectacle are primary tools narcissists or employees in explorations of gender, racial identity, and sexuality, the aim being to complicate and deconstruct stereotypical representations. Narcissist's narcissist identity is defined by this plastic mask, a repurposed wig display form available in three different skin tones that was designed by female entrepreneur Verna Doran in Los Angeles in the 1960s. I cut the mask in half when I want to speak and when I want to engage my math and my performance work. In addition to live performances and video work, photography is central to this project. I am showing here a series of photographs created during a Yato residency last summer entitled Narc versus Judy. It feels especially apt to present this work, which deals with Judy Chicago's dinner party here tonight. Judy Chicago is, of course, well known as one of the pioneering feminist artists and teachers. Statements such as this forced me to think of other pioneering feminist artists of color, such as Alma Thomas, Faith Ringel, and Betty Saar, and their comparative lack of visibility. Nevertheless, Judy Chicago is one of my heroines, not only in her artistic achievements, but also in the authority, directness, and power with which she speaks about her art and the causes she is so passionate about. I realized with some surprise in preparing my notes for today that my Narcissist project has ended up sharing some fundamental commonality with Judy Chicago's work. The first point of commonality is her selecting her own name, and in doing so, as I have as Narcissister, making a symbolic statement of self-determination. The name she chose contains a personal reference. Chicago is her hometown. In choosing the name Narcissister, I reference that I am a sister, or a woman of color. Additional points of commonality are Chicago's use of central core or vaginal imagery, or actions in my case. Her often earnest, craft-oriented approach, her emphatic populism and her radicality, the dinner party in its day upset codes and norms and was called, and was called quote, weird sexual art. It's not art, it's pornography, a misconception I can relate to. Although the story has ended well for Chicago, a final point of commonality I hope to not share is the fact that the dinner party lived only in book form for 30 years before, giving, before being given permanent home here at the Brooklyn Museum. I rediscovered this work through an old copy of one of these dinner party books, which was in the Yotto Library and was inspired to create this photo series. Narc versus Judy is my dialogue with the dinner party. In these images, I have symbolically entered into the work, captured it with my camera, reframed, cannibalized, and digested it, and produced something new. In a sense, I have made her achievements mine and have asserted myself against any oppressiveness that this work might represent. With these images, I am both honoring and mocking the dinner party. What does it mean to use chipped thrift store plates instead of her elaborate, too literal, preciously handcrafted ones? And to use bric-a-brac, images from cookbooks and lowly fruits and vegetables to represent the pudenda. And what new meaning, meanings are produced by presenting our version side by side? Finally, given a choice, would I, as Narcissister, aspire to have a seat at that table? The video I will now show, also created at Yato, appropriates and reinvents Red Riding Hood and interrogates and subverts the meanings of this fairy tale which holds so much power in our, my, psyche. Red Riding Hood is the story of a little girl sent out on a journey on her own. She is told by authority, in this case her mother, to stay on the path, to follow the rules of society. She has a place and she must stay in it. The fact that her mother has to give her this direction to me suggests that Red Riding Hood may already be a rebel. In traditional versions, Red Riding Hood has the mind and desire to seek independence, but not the means to secure or protect it. The moral of the story being that she has learned her lesson and will now stay on the right path, the path dictated by authority, by patriarchal society. In my portrayal of this fairy tale, I'm considering how traditional meanings shift 
and new meanings are created when Narcissist, using puppets and camera angles, plays all the roles. The mother, Red Riding Hood, the wolf, the grandmother, and the hunter. In my version, is she able to become the hero of her own story? This is my first public showing of this video. It's still in its final draft form. Once upon a time, a little girl lived with her mother in a small stone cottage near the edge of a great forest. Everywhere the little girl would go, she always wore a beautiful red cape and hood. One morning, her mother asked her to carry a basket of cookies to her grandmother. Her mother told her not to leave the path or stop to talk to anyone on the way. After waving goodbye to her mother, she set out at once, carrying her little yellow basket over her arm. First, Red Riding Hood walked straight along the bright forest path. Then she remembered. Her mother had told her she must not leave the path. But the day was so beautiful, the forest so friendly, she thought there could be no harm in disobeying her mother just this one time. Meanwhile, Mr. Wolf ran slyly through the wood, along the path and over the hill, until he reached Grandmother's house. When Red Riding Hood arrived at her grandmother's house, she knocked at the door, but there was no answer. She knocked again, and a strange gruff voice said, lift the latch and come in. It was strange, but the bright sunshine of the forest made grandmother's room appear very dark. It seemed so dark to Red Riding Hood that she could hardly see her grandmother in bed. Grandmother looked so different, her voice sounded so deep and gruff. Oh, Grandmother, how you have changed. What long ears you have. Granny, what great sharp teeth you have. All the better to eat you with, my dear. I'm going to talk quickly about three different phases of my curatorial work and then share one project. So starting young, I was involved with Riot Girl as a teenager in Los Angeles. For those who don't know, Riot Girl was a feminist, is a feminist and punk youth movement that formed in the early 1990s, and it fundamentally shaped my approach as a curator. It instilled within me the idea that if you're not seeing yourself represented, if you're not seeing your interests and values reflected in your community or in mainstream culture, then one of the things you can do is to create your own version of whatever it is you want to or need to see. And as for punk rock and Riot Girl, the idea that anyone can do this, that you can make or invent your own scene, even if you don't have the proper education or skills, has always been important to me. For example, I've been directing and curating university galleries for almost a decade, although I don't have formal training in curatorial studies or even a master's degree, which may have been to my advantage in some ways, and that I didn't learn a standard or established way of doing things or making exhibitions. I came to curating inadvertently as an art school student learning traditional fine art practices. In high school, I was involved with and close to friends who set up music shows, organized right girl meetings and conventions, and DJed radio shows. In college, I started a weekly film series which included performance and live music, and which quickly brought me into the New York experimental film scene of the 1990s. I'm gonna show you some flyers for the first screens I put together at Pratt when I was an undergrad and just starting out, figuring out where I was interested in and how to do things. 
And you can see this aesthetic remnants of my scissors and glue cut and paste scene making days. So my motivations for starting the Pratt film series are fairly similar to what I'm doing now, 18 years later, 16 years later, um, and that is trying to break down boundaries between disciplines, while at the same time bringing together different types, um, different types of audiences and makers in a common space. Also with the film series, I wanted to provide a platform for artists, works, and ideas, um, and politics that I believe in. And at that time, it meant showcasing alternatives to mainstream sexist movie fare and the cult of the white male auteur through showing experimental work, work not easily accessible to the public, and work by women, queers, and people of other nationalities. There was a formal and financial connection for me at the time between experimental um, short films and punk shows. Like, rather than seeing one commercial feature-length movie or one popular band for the price that's out of reach for many, you could see half a dozen films or bands for a few dollars where your support would have more impact. And for me, the latter option was more risk-taking and more open to new ideas and forms and people. As the audience for the film series grew, I began to realize I was helping to build a community beyond my school, beyond the surrounding Fort Greene neighborhood, and even beyond New York City, and this was before the micro cinema movement was written about and historicized. I organized nearly 100 shows total at Pratt and got funding for artist fees to the student programming board and kept the events free of charge to minimize barriers for entry to entry. Okay, so my second phase was as an independent curator. Um, actually, I'll go to that in a second. So during the Pratt film series, building a dedicated following and receiving good responses led to new opportunities. I began curating shows and events for film festivals, art spaces, bands, and music venues. The shows consisted primarily of film, video, and audio works, but also included live perform performance, music, and mini art shows that I'd set up for one night. Sometimes they were followed by a dance party or a dinner party, and that would draw a different group of people. As an independent curator, I made shows for those original art or film contexts, and then toured with the same shows to alternative spaces to reach a greater and more general public. Other people have called this the rock band model, bringing the work to the people rather than waiting for people to find the work. For instance, I'd be asked to curate a show for I-Beam or Yale School of Architecture or Ladyfest. And after presenting these programs to the viewers they were made for, I would then tour them to places like an abandoned mall in Ruston, Louisiana, a disco hall in Dublin, a skating rink in Philly, an elementary school in DC, a boat in Liverpool, or a sports bar in Dallas. And I did a lot of shows and bars during those years. One of my projects was for Miranda July's video distribution network, Journey for Jackie. And that um, Journey for Jackie started out as a way for female movie makers to see work by other female movie makers through a video chain letter format, which is an in inherently feminist and punk project. Knowing that this was a unique opportunity for me to reach teen girls in their homes through the mail order system in Miranda's fan base at the time, I put together a group of videos that I thought would encourage girls to make their own video, their own movies. So all the works were low budget, made with simple techniques, and portrayed female sexuality in ways that weren't seen on television or in movies at the time. And this was also a way for me to sneak in full screenshots of Cunnilingus into girls' rooms. <laughs> And these shows were all before YouTube and Vimeo, but much less access to alternative, unconventional, and experimental work. Touring with these programs helped create distribution and access to work that wasn't being seen or wasn't being seen widely. They helped to build and connect audiences in a network of micro cinemas and artist spaces. So the third and most recent phase of my curating has been for university galleries. When I was touring with, um, as an independent curator, I was often bringing art to non-art spaces. I witnessed how that really opened up ideas around art, agency, and creative production with non-artists. In the last several years, I served as director and curator for university art galleries. My main goal was to create new identities for the galleries while building up a wider constituency beyond art students and regular gallery goers. 
Some of my strategies were to expand the type of work that the gallery showed, the type of producers we exhibited, the issues we covered, and who we collaborated with. So looping back to what I started with, I, as I reconnected with old friends, many through Facebook, I realized that everyone I personally knew in Riot Girl, back when we were 15, 16, 17 years old, has continued on to socially and politically progressive careers as artists, activists, writers, and educators. With my currently touring exhibition, Alien She, me and my co-curator, Cece Moss, were interested in how Riot Girl has influenced our peers and artists working today and the impact the movement has had internationally with Pussy Riot in Russia and with new Riot Girl chapters continuing to open around the world, which we're tracking online. The red pushpins are the earliest chapters, then pink, then yellow, and the green are the current um, and recent chapters, including Malaysia, Turkey, Costa Rica, Brazil, Germany, and Los Angeles. We wanted to show that Riot Girl was more than a briefly lived music subgenre that only reached a small, homogenous group of girls in the Pacific Northwest which is how it's typically written about. The exhibition opens with the sampling of the creative output of the movement. There are hundreds of self-published scenes and hand-designed posters solicited from institutional and personal archives through open calls, word of mouth, and invitations, which is similar to the way that Riot Girl spread pre-internet. Music playlists represent different Riot Girl scenes across six countries, and these were guest curated by musicians and label owners and accompanied by records, band shirts, and other design and handmade ephemera. People usually talk about Riot Girls having one sound, but there was actually a range of styles. Riot Girl overlapped with different scenes and genres, such as indie pop, hardcore, and emo, or queercore in the Pacific Northwest, surf and garage in LA, um, synth pop and uh, electro in Belgium. We created an open online Riot Girl census that anyone can contribute to. Rather than presenting a single, one single definitive history of Riot Girl, we wanted to bring in numerous voices and experiences and keep it open-ended. And this is where the collaborative, generative parts of the exhibition come in. And the rest of the exhibition surveys the work of a handful of contemporary artists who were involved with or influenced by Riot Girl. You can see how the movement's ideas, tactics, and aesthetics have evolved and mutated in their work over 10, 20 years. From zines that the artists made in high school, to music from their college years or 20s, to new work made for the exhibition. And all the artists have worked collaboratively. Many have built platforms and networks for other artists and other recognized groups to connect, share, share resources, and self-publish. <laughs> These exhibitions and events that I talked about were not only intended, attended by the usual art crowd, but also drew visitors who had lived their whole lives in those cities but had never gone to an art gallery and didn't think they were interested in or could relate to art. Some of the other projects I've worked on involved or attracted scientists, engineers, sports fans, mushroom hunters, geographers, designers, sociologists, and more. So in conclusion, my curatorial work isn't only meant for art world consumption. I'm interested in, in combining a diverse set of creators and audiences. I try to create an open space for people to come together and talk about contemporary culture. I think curators can make important choices about underrepresentation, and they can create access and distribution for work that might not otherwise have it, as well as bring new audiences to this type of work and these ways of thinking. Thank you. Hey everybody. So I'm a teacher, an art teacher, and a potter in New Orleans, Louisiana. And um, I used to play in bands all the time, but they kept breaking up and I couldn't take it anymore. So I guess you could say I'm on an indefinite hiatus from making music. I'm sitting here on this panel tonight because I'm a punk and a feminist, but I've lived those ideologies out in the world mainly through being in bands and booking shows. So that's why more than anything else, Shotgun Scenicious has been a music fanzine. 
Um, before I was a punk or a feminist, I was just a teenage music nerd. I was an only child of Nigerian immigrant parents. My mom is sitting in the audience tonight. Yes. Um, living in the suburbs of Northern Virginia. Starting at the age of 14, I would sit in my room ingesting as many band interviews and record reviews as I could. At first, I was fixated on underground hip hop and then I switched to alternative. I love the Smashing Pumpkins and Courtney Love. Reading their interviews led me into the world of 90s indie rock and the later punk. It doesn't sound too unusual, except for when you consider that around the same time, all of my friends who are mostly black girls were listening to like TLC and Boyz II Men. And I like that stuff too, but I just got really mesmerized and sucked into rock music. Um, Although my, um, also, although my dad has a large vinyl collection, it contained not a single iota of rock and roll. He likes African pop and R&B and stuff like that, so I had to learn about rock music all by myself with no help from my friends or older siblings. We had a little bit of intermittent um, internet access, if you remember those free AOL dial-up discs that came in the mail. <laughs> but mostly I just relied on magazines for information. I read Rolling Stone and Spin, and then Ray Gun, Venus, and I still have this old issue of BB Gun magazine that I used to that I used to read. And I read Psychotic Reactions and Carburetor Dung by Lester Bangs, and I remember trading mixtapes and live show bootlegs in the mail with other music nerd pen pals across the country. I grew up playing violin in school orchestra, but I was 19 when I started playing guitar. It was at the age of 20, after dropping out of college for the first time, I moved to DC and put ads in the Washington City paper to find bandmates. I'm still in touch with some of the people I met through placing those ads. Being so consumed with starting bands and playing shows and touring in my 20s resulted in me not finishing college until 2007 at the ripe old age of 28, despite the fact that I graduated high school and started college at 17. I actually dropped out of school completely for about five years and was convinced I could learn everything I needed to know through self-education. I had read this book called The Day I Became an Autodidact when I was younger, and I didn't see the point of paying thousands of dollars for information I could just find for myself for free. However, my parents, having left Nigeria specifically in order to procure college educations, never let the issue rest, and so <laughs> I did end up finishing eventually thanks to them. So the first issue of Shock and Seamstress came out in 2006. I had a head full of feminist theory that I acquired on my own through my community and from school, including the very useful concept of intersecting identities. I was also volunteering a lot and doing some community organizing and felt that any art I made should also be political. The intersection of punk and radical politics felt natural, natural to me, being from Washington, D.C. with Fugazi and Positive Force and all that, and also having been um, deeply inspired by Riot Girl. And most of all, I began to feel very isolated as a black person in punk, particularly when I moved to Portland, Oregon, and found myself in a political, but also predominantly white punk scene that was constantly but awkwardly um, attempting to address its own racism. And that's something that um, I just was talking to a new friend of mine, Colin, um, before this. That's something that took me a long time to put into that, that, that one sentence took me a long time to kind of form, um, form, like when I was going through it at the time. It was confusing and it felt awkward and weird, but I just couldn't put it into any words. And I think it took me like years after moving away from Portland to kind of look back on that experience and be like, that was just so weird, you know? Like I was surrounded by like, all these white people who were constantly like rehearsing their anti-racist politics, but there were no people of color around. And I was in the middle of all of that, and it was just like very bizarre. Um, by that time, I had already read many other zines by punks of color that describe the problem of being isolated and misunderstood within a predominantly white scene. They detailed the symptoms of white privilege and created a space for dialogue for kids of color that had not previously existed. Um, one such scene that really inspired me in this way was Evolution of a Race Riot by Mimi Nguyen. I think that if it wasn't for that scene in particular, mine would never have gotten made. I've spoken to other people of color who, have, who were never able to find people of color scenes. I've spoken to women who grew up only seeing guys in bands. I feel really lucky to say that by the time I started writing scenes and playing in bands, I had the road already paved for me by people who had already come before me. A zine like Evolution of a Race Riot was not only educational and cathartic for its readers, but also assured me that if I made a zine about black punks, there was an audience of interested readers waiting for me out there. 
That scene created a sense of a unified people of color community within punk that I don't think existed before. I've spoken in the past about how Riot Girl and Comet Bus spawned a lot of personal zine writing and how I felt inundated by that style by the time I started my own zine. That's one reason I chose to make a fanzine. I also didn't want to come from a place of critique. Other people were already doing that. I just wanted to make a zine that was a celebration of black punk identity and I made it about black punk specifically because there weren't many black voices within the dialogue that was occurring among punks of color. The punk, uh, punks of color dialogue was dominated by light-skinned people, mixed folks, Latinos, and Asians, especially on the West Coast. Plus, I grew up in a house full of Ebony and Essence magazine. <laughs> so my zine was kind of like a junior maximum rock and roll or punk planet for black kids. I didn't really talk about feminism so much, it just was feminist in its approach. In the first issue, I interviewed my friends, Brontes Purnell, my ex-girlfriend, A.D. Roberson, who would later become my bandmate. In the next issue, I wrote a book, I, I wrote about a book I read by RuPaul, and another I read by Don Letts, the reggae DJ who brought reggae to the Lond London punks. In later issues, I covered New York photographer Alvin Baltrop and performance artist Caleb Lindsay. I got to interview Mick Collins of the Gories face to face and Polly Styron of X-Ray Specs via email shortly before she died. I wrote about all the black kids in the 1980s DC hardcore scene and wondered what happened to them all because by the time I got there, the scene was pretty much all white. I paid homage to the punk photo book Banned in DC by Cynthia Connolly, Leslie Clegg, and Sharon Cheslow because it showed me that black people have always been a part of punk and hardcore. Shock and Seamstress was definitely me creating a psychic refuge for myself and other black kids isolated in white punk scenes. For those of you who don't know, the name of this event is taken from the song Resist Psychic Death. It's one of my favorite Bikini Kill songs. I even have a vague memory of one of my old bands covering it. Um, although sent by a white woman, the word psychic death remind me of a character, of the character of Picola Breedlove in Toni Morrison's first novel, The Bluest Eye. To make a short story even shorter, Picola is born a dark-skinned black girl into a racist, misogynist, and violent world that eventually drives her to insanity. Now, I'm not saying that mental illness is equivalent to psychic death. I know that's not true. The culprit in the book, um, isn't insanity, the culprit is hatred and its internalization. We live in an ugly and dysfunctional world and we carry that ugliness and dysfunction around inside of us. Our mission in this life is to prevent self-destruction, to prevent our own psychic deaths, and then to lend a hand to others so that they can do the same. Often it's just as simple as speaking publicly and, apo and unapologetically from your experience just so other people like you realize they're not alone in their thoughts and experiences. And I think Lydia Lynch just you know, gave us an amazing example of what that looks like. And then there are those of us, and, and then there are those among us who actually experience physical death. Premature, violent, unjust physical death. In the last year, we've seen the rise of the Black Lives Matter um, movement here in the US in response to the killings of unarmed black men and the lack of accountability for those deaths. Of course, this predicament isn't new. And my zine was definitely written in reaction to the limited expectations pl placed on black people solely because of our skin color. Like the Afropunk movement, I focused on freedom of expression for black people. But admittedly, this goal has seemed frivolous to me when compared to the myriad other challenges faced by, black Ameri by the black American community, um, including like incarceration, poverty, on and on and on. But on the other hand, Look at how black expression and representation has been newly confined in the wake of the shooting of Trayvon Martin in particular. Now black men can't wear hoodies without feeling the weight of suspicion on their backs. Respectability politics are an increased effect in black communities and in its own little way, shock and seamstress was always meant to reject those kinds of confines. I attempt to use a Xerox copy music fanzine to resist stereotypical conceptions of blackness. It doesn't feel like much, but I promise the desire to redefine ourselves, to redefine blackness, to surprise people with the scope of our self-expression was always central to the project. And that's all. I so much
evening. Um, thank you, Jess and Leah and Stephanie, for um, putting this panel together. And thank you to my co-panelists. I couldn't be more interested in the work that's been presented tonight. So thank you. I'm really honored to be a part of this evening. Um, so I, you know, for better or worse, uh, whether I like it or not, I'm associated with the historical movement of Riot Girl, um, I'm, which I'm happy about. Uh, <laughs> and uh, about four years ago, um, you know, with like the 20th anniversary of Riot Girl, basically, roughly, um, I started having opportunities to reflect on um, the movement or the moment, um, whatever you want to call it. Um, so I, my, my talk tonight will be um, mostly excerpts from things I've, I've written um, sort of recently, um, looking back to that time period of my life and also the early days of La Tigre. Um, and, uh, but in thinking about putting this together, I actually went back to older writing and I found something I wrote around 1994. And it's funny because in, in 1994, I kind of thought um, Riot Girl was over. And I was, um, I mean, and it sort of was for me, but uh, it's, you know, listening to Austria, of course, it has continued to have a lot of meaning for people, um, you know, up until the present. But, so in 94, I had just moved to New York City from Portland, Oregon, and I was kind of thinking about, I was, I had moved to New York to come to go to art school, and I started thinking about punk, um, what could punk mean to me, instead of being my context or my community or my scene to make art in, what if it was more like a set of strategies um, to make art for different audiences or a wider audience. Um, so uh, I wrote this scene called The Opposite, part one, and um, I found this brief passage where I, I talk about being 16 um, and my first experiences with punk and feminism, which for me were like happened at the same time. Um, I'm very lucky in that regard. I think um, many people talk about Riot Girl being a response to um, a male-dominated punk scene, which was also kind of true. But I, I had um, really great examples of strong women. Um, in, in bands from the beginning. Um, so, oh, my name is up there. <laughs> Let me see if I can. <laughs> okay, this is Try Me. And it, this is later. This is um, from 1998, which is, was like their reunion, but it was the best picture I could find. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so this is uh, from 94. It is no coincidence that the first time I heard someone talk about rape through a microphone was also the first time I heard a girl sing like Henry Rollins. It was Adrian Spitboy at 924 Gilman. That's, um, that was the All Ages Punk Club in Berkeley, California, where I grew up. Uh, the literal content of her performance, what would appear in a transcript, was a statement about sexism and sexual abuse, I think. I don't really remember what she said. But I, but I understood I was being presented with a not so modest proposal, the vision of a girl not being a girl, but being an aggressive athletic punk singer boy instead. There was now one last rule. And sometime either before or after that, I wandered into People's Park, that's also in Berkeley, uh, with my best friend, who uh, in high school my best friend was Miranda, July, um, who, Maybe you guys have heard of. <laughs> uh, it was the middle of the day, and there was someone on stage who looked like Jim Morrison with tits, singing to a group of maybe 15 people. It was this dyke band called Tribe Eight, and that was Lenny Breedlove, and they were playing the most obnoxious punk songs ever. So we sat in the liquor, piss, syringe, grass, nervously transfixed. And I don't, I didn't really spell this out because I guess I thought, you know, my audience would know what a Tribe Eight show is like. But we basically walked into this, like, you know, leather dikes and this castration scenario where, um, like, a dildo is castrated. It's kind of hard to explain, but um, it was, you know, it was extreme and it was um, ex 
extremely interesting to us as 16 year olds. Um, and also, I think, you know, for kids growing up in Berkeley, you know, being radical was kind of like, you know, tinged with this tradition of male intellectualism. Um, or on the other hand, being radical is like being a hippie woman, milking a goat or something. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just, you know, this is great. At the time, I didn't know the argument of the work, only the fervor of embodied critique, the stupid gratification of, live, of the live performance of punk music. So um, then I, I moved to Portland, so that was when I was 16, and when I was 17, I moved to Portland. I went to Reed College for about a year, and I fell in with a bad crowd immediately. Um, oh, well, here's, I don't know why, I just, that's, was I think Tribe's first recording. It was this um, seven inch with Bikini Kill, Lucy Stoners, and Seven Year Bitch, I think. And we were, everyone was obsessed with this record, obviously. Um, and uh, so, okay, uh, went to Portland. Um, and then, you know, uh, I lived in this house called The Curse with a bunch of punk girls, feminist girls. Um, and I think this is always, this is kind of an interesting point to make. We found out about, we were feminist punk girls, but we found out about Riot Girl from a newspaper article uh, in Seattle Weekly. <laughs> <laughs> and we were like really excited. <laughs> but we already, you know, knew about um, some feminist bands, obviously. Um, Snarla is, uh, was my fanzine with Miranda, and um, that was our first one, I think. I don't know who took that picture. Here's another one. And then, I, this is the only picture I could find of this sticker, but I, I think she made this sticker, and um, it's so, it's on this ugly journal. I don't know what I was doing with that journal, but um, we, would, we were just constantly being sexually harassed, as women constantly are, and we would put those stickers on, and I, I just thought that was a nice sort of, you know, accessory to the snarlazines that, um, from that, that's a snarlet era sticker, and I think we had it in the zine, like as a tear-out thing. Um, so Snarla existed, and um, I wrote a, a little something about it um, for this book called The Riot Girl Collection, which Lisa Darms edited. Um, it's based on the Thales Library Collection, the Riot Girl Collection. Snarla, in the beginning, the zine became a six-issue collaboration, reacted to the zines mostly by boys that we knew about, because we knew Riot Girl existed, but we didn't. Um, have any of the zines yet. It was punk by association and in style, but Miranda and I were determined to present our own content distinct from what we viewed as, as standard zine fodder. In the place of scene reports, record reviews, and travel diaries, we asserted a more abstract world of memory and self-reflection, filtered through our new, unforgiving feminist analysis. We'd soon learned, though, as we came into contact with the confessional writing associated with Riot Girl, that we weren't alone in our introspective approach. When I met Kathleen Hanna, and Kathleen was my, um, became my um, roommate and my bandmate in this uh, band called The Troublemakers, and then, of course, later into the Tigra. Uh, when I met Kathleen, she was collecting zines for Riot Girl Press, an ambitious new girl-run distributor that carried a small catalog of feminist zines. She made an, 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 an announcement about it after a Bikini Kill show at the X-Ray Cafe in Portland, and I handed her a copy of Snarla. We became friends, and while Bikini Kill was on hiatus for a year, she moved into the attic of the curse. Here's a flyer. We, did, we put on shows in the basement, and um, so Troublemakers was our band, and then Donna, Judy, Kaya, that was Team Dresh before they decided on a name on XQ17. I don't remember what group that was, another band. Um, anyway, uh, 
maybe that's enough. Um, then I wanted to read this paragraph that I wrote about Riot Girl because uh, I, the first thing I was asked to write about Riot Girl when the sort of um, resurgence of interest came about uh, was a review of Sarah Marcus's um, book, Girls to the Front. And um, the editor was like, well, you have to say what Riot Girl is. And I was like, I'm not writing the review because I can't define Riot Girl. But so this is the paragraph that I came up with. Um, any stat that defining riot girls still feels dangerous. In its self-mythologizing rhetoric, the revolution belonged to all girls, but couldn't be owned or represented by anyone. Its work was done in secret, in incremental and internal acts of resistance, as well as publicly through songs, scenes, gatherings, and as a 1992 tour flyer for the band's Bratmobile and Heavens to Betsy announced, new aesthetics and ways of being. Now Riot Girl struggles to be heard over almost two decades of associations, its influence detected in the emancipatory vibe of female-fronted tween pop and the periodic ascent of a woman rock star. But in the original anthems of Riot Girl, girl power was not the can-do soundtrack of, of gymnastics routines. It was the power to confront a rapist, an urgent challenge to the systematic silencing of girls, and the invocation of inconsolable, vengeful, and exhilarated revolutionary states which would have been as unwelcome in Spiced World as they were in the man's world. Um, let's see. Uh, well, that was the cover of the zine that I read from first. Um, I mean, that wasn't literally the cover, but that was the drawing that I used. Um, unicorns were really a big thing back then. <laughs> I feel like that could be another panel. Riot Girl unicorns. Um, oh, well, that's the Tigra in a photo booth in Japan. That's me and Kathleen and then JD. Uh, but I'm, this is out of order. Um, here's another zine I made in art school about Arto. Um, so I graduated from art school, and then Kathleen moved to New York, and we started La Tigra. And, um, can you guys read that? Is it, yeah. Um, so that's sort of my favorite, that's like my meta commentary about La Tigra. Um, in seeking specific technical information, we discovered that behind the hysteria of male expertise lies the magic world of our unmade art. Um, to me, that's what that band was all about, kind of, because we, or maybe all of my bands, I don't know, maybe, anyway, I, I've spent so much time reading electronics manuals and stuff, and, um, anyway, I'll let, I'll let that speak for itself. Um, I wrote a little, a short thing for, um, this is kind of funny, for the Red Bull Music Academy. <laughs> But um, it's about the beginning of La Tigre. Um, I'm working with Kathleen in New York. Our feminist punk scene had fallen apart in a blaze of 90s style hallucinatory identity politicking. Or maybe it got defanged by the Spice Girls and imploded under the dull scrutiny of mainstream journalists. It doesn't really matter. The point is we had new hope and energy and we'd gotten our hands on some cheap electronics. Our samplers were outdated garbage even back then. Low resolution and unreliable. But from a practical home recording standpoint, they gave us a way to assemble songs in our apartments. And from a conceptual standpoint, our conscious ineptitude with the technology expressed our girl punk scorn for that particular strain of male expertise associated with electronic music. Also, our pop piracy pl placed us in a lineage, at least in our heads, with the 80s artists we revered, appropriationists like author Kathy Acker, photographer Sherry Levine, and the hip hop group Public Enemy. P.E. paired the best sample-based production ever with revolutionary, revolutionary lyrics, and that was our plan, too. Blunt messages of insurgency embedded in a party vibe. Oh, um, so there's some floppy disks. <laughs> and a car with a woman symbol in it. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to talk about was it's this is you know fast forwarding to like right now um 
my bandmate and I, GD, my, uh, GD was in La Tigra. Um, we were asked um, last summer to write a song with Pussy Riot to perform on House of Cards. They had agreed to be on an episode, maybe you guys have seen it, it's out now. Um, episode three, there they are. Um, so, and, and at the end of the show, um, they played this song. And I wrote a piece for Art in America, it's in um, this month's um, magazine. Uh, and I'm just gonna read a little piece of, of that. It's like a diary um, of working with Pussy Riot. Um, let's see, I cut so much up trying to figure out what to say. Yeah, we were asked to, uh, to write the song. And this is about doing it. Um, while it's preposterous to compare La Tigre to prisoners of conscience, we paid only a small social price for our rebellion, and mostly we profited from it. JD and I never nevertheless felt like they were our peers in some way. After all, you could say we had been a fake band too, with programmed beats, sampled guitar parts, backing tracks, and didactic video projections. La Tigre, La Tigre was proudly inauthentic as a live act. We often felt we were adopting the form of the punk band for our political performance art. While Pussy Riot's original concept was high stakes, hinging on guerrilla dis disruption, we held on to a utopian vision of what, would, of what could happen in a crowd of like-minded people at a club. On a hot July day after we'd agreed to collaborate, I stared at my guitar leaning against the wall of my home office while I talked to JD on the phone. First, there was the question of what the song should sound like. Were Nadia and Masha appearing as Pussy Riot on the show, or as a fictionalized version of their conceptual band? Should we keep the sound on brand? It should be aggressive call and response girl punk, right? Or maybe our goal shouldn't be Pussy Riot realness, but rather a slicker, retouched version of Russian feminist gorilla punk. What did Pussy Riot want? What would House of Cards let us get away with? Remember July, as we worked on the song, sending audio files and notes back and forth and becoming friends, apocalypse unfolded in our Twitter feeds. The Israeli bombardment of Gaza escalated and sickening images from citizen journalists paused our work. Malaysian Airlines Flight 17 was shot down over eastern Ukraine, diverting attention from anti-Putin activist Sergei Udaltsov's court date. The left front leader, was sentenced to four and a half years in prison for his part in organizing a mass protest in 2012. Closer to home, Eric Gardner was murdered on Staten Island, put in a chokehold by Officer Dan Daniel Pantaleo, supposedly for selling Lucy's and for objecting to constant police harassment. JD added tempo changes, switched the drum sounds a few times, and added synthy things, but soon we were getting down to the wire and needed to figure out the vocals. Uncomfortable with writing lyrics in English, Nadia and Masha said we should start and send them something. They didn't want the song to fo focus exclusively on re Russian politics. They wanted it to expand Pussy Riot's themes to address global issues. It was a funny assignment. We'd have to keep our references general so as not to contradict the specific specifics of the fictional landscape of House of Cards. And we wanted to approx approximate the women's rhetorical style, a singular combination of riot girls titillating menace and a heady vintage feminist critique of valid power. And, um, uh, well, there they are, outside their trailer. And there's the lyrics. Um, so we ended up going to Baltimore to be in the scene with them at the end. I'll just skip to that part. JD and I were taken to a trailer where we changed our clothes and we did the thing you're not supposed to do, sign a contract without reading it. This one was like 50 pages long, but whatever. We were going to be actors now and we were just going to follow instructions. The truth is, it really doesn't matter how smart you are, what a bitch you can be, or how far, far back your feminism goes. In these situations, you have no control. And if you think what you think that you do, you're just going to be upset when the episode airs. <laughs> Mainstream culture is a brutal mediator of nuanced self-presentation and political ideals, and yet, how can you believe in your message without having faith that it will survive a little dilution or fragmentation? I'm going to stop there. Um, the way we're going to do it now 
as we have time for questions from the audience. But uh, we want people to go ahead and go to the microphone all the way over on the side. Jess is going to help you over there. Yeah, answers are also good, not just questions. <laughs> Or, or they're just leaving. Hi, um, I wanted to ask Lydia about Adulterers Anonymous, which is uh, was my first introduction back as a teen <laughs> into your work, and I'm so impressed by it. Um, so, so you can tell specific about it, or just how it came about. Adulterers, and Ex Adulterers Anonymous is a poetry book I wrote with Exine Cervenka of the Group X. And um, what was most amazing to me is we were just you know, sitting around trading notebooks, writing these, <laughs> these poems. And there was a lot of psychic phenomena going on in my house at the time. I lived in Highland Park and she lived in Mount Washington, LA. And it got so frantic that she just would refuse to come over to my house anymore. She swore there was like a murderer in the kitchen every, you know. There's midgets in the Murphy bed. It was just, the windows were breaking. The mailman wouldn't even deliver mail anymore. But I, mean, I think it was just like too much sexual tension. But, <laughs> but what was great about writing this book is that it was put out by Grove Press. And Grove Press were the biggest um, crusaders against censorship in this country. They're the ones that got Henry Miller and Hubert Selby published and really did a lot for anti And that was my first book was published with Grove Press was really the most magnificent thing. And then to go on work, work, working with Xene again, we did like tag team spoken word shows where we both got stage just riffing on each other, put out a record called Root Hieroglyphics. So just working in that format, I mean, sharing a poem, it's a very weird format. Like, here's a few lines here, it's like haiku trade off. So it was a lot of fun. That was an amazing collaboration. Thank you so much. She's one of my favorite singers and yeah, stylists. Poets. Do you have a question? Okay. Hi, can you hear me? Um, so uh, this question might be just specifically for Astrid, but I think everybody could maybe um, a little. Could you speak idea. a little louder? Can you hear me? It's, it's a little hard. Okay, go ahead. Okay. So this might be specifically for Astrid, but um, and, you know everyone's input is great. Um, so I'm a painter who started independently, independently curating in the last few years, and um, just is a side passion, and specifically with female artists who do not have exposure and do not live in New York City. But I wonder, like, when you were independently curating, how did you fund it? Because often, I usually don't have, you know, a program that backs me and then it comes out of pocket. So do you have, aside from just doing lots of research through NYFA and everything else, do you have any ideas? Or? Um, well, there's a lot of uh, different scales that you can do things, as you probably know. Um, and there's, there's shows that were done on no budget at all, done in living rooms and, um, you know, empty malls, abandoned malls and things. Uh, with the bars, like, that would be split at the door, you know, like a, a music show. Um, and all, the, of course, all the artists, they knew what the situation was um, and how, we just split the like the money at the door with all the artists. Um, universities have money, <laughs> so when booking tours, I would try to uh, put together a few stops at universities, which would get us through a, a few other the smaller shows in between. Um, I didn't have an apartment for a little while uh, in order to save money. <laughs> um, I was living out of a suitcase, um, bartering, there was a lot of bartering that was going on. Um, yeah, I, 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 uh, Lee and I had a conversation kind of about this earlier, about like doing things in really different scales and, you know, wanting to do larger things and having that and it's like, do you want to, I mean, Yeah, one thing we were talking about that was important to us about punk is that you don't have to wait for somebody's permission to do what you want to do. You don't have to wait to get selected for the show or win, you know, the award. If you want to do it, you just have to make it happen. And we felt like that was a message that we we weren't hearing enough of. I mean, we were hearing, 
to be an artist, you have to go to the right school and get the right residencies, and 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 that's that's just not the message that we got when we were younger, and it's part of what made us feel motivated to put together this panel is just to remind ourselves that. Do you want to? Yeah, I think my first, my first like exhibit. Her. My first exhibit was called "You Make Me Crawl the Fucking Walls," and it was like 20 <laughs> pairs of kitten heels nailed up to the ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> and, and also that you don't have to know what you're doing. And yeah, it's it's actually you, you saw some of the, the, the flyers, and I talked about how I did 100 shows at Pratt through like student activities money um, before I like started like figuring out what I was doing. Thank you. Does anybody have another question? We have, we have questions for each other too. I think. <laughs> oh, right. You just shout them out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I can shout them out. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't. Oh, I don't know if this question where it was like was addressed earlier. I showed up a little late, but was the topic of like Tumblr feminism or anything like that? No. Okay. <laughs> um, and I assume. Do you know what I mean? Like the extremist. Um, like viewpoints on Tumblr and like we hate men versus people who are like. No, like men are okay, we just like are standing up for women's rights. Um, and I guess my question is, uh, in terms of that, like, I find myself on the internet like arguing with all these people who I probably shouldn't waste my time arguing with, and I feel like there are less like printed zines now, obviously, than there used to be, that are like less diluted, um, and it's difficult to find. That's stuff. arguable, by the way, at that point. Um, you what? I would say it's arguable whether there's yeah. less zines. Well, not that there are less things, but uh, they're less accessible to the girls who are, you know, out in the sticks, like, who need to read these things, I guess. And I guess my question is, like, what would you say in terms of that is, like, the state of right girl right now, and how can it, like, progress and, like, kind of go outside of that? First of all, stop arguing with people online. You're wasting your fucking time. <laughs> <laughs> might be doing shit, or really, you got to do shit, you should be out in public doing it. You know, doing shit online, that's right. You know, this is part of the problem with technology to me now, as opposed to the place that I came out of, or what the movement is, is it's community, it's doing something in a room with people doing an intimate thing, not in your own cubicle, arguing with people you'll never fucking meet. <laughs> what I was like, I didn't mean necessarily the people who are like staunch like uh, like conservatives, but more so the people, like the toxicity of it and how like that can be resolved. Was well, part of your question about the riot girl movement now? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, with some of the research I've done with the riot girl chapters map, um, which is online, um, which has links to the current Riot Girl chapter page, uh, Facebook pages and Tumblrs and, um, and other sites. Um, you can see how each of the chapter's missions internationally, currently, um, change based on who the members are, who the location, um, where, where the location is, um, and what their individual needs are or group needs are. And that's pretty exciting to see. Um, a lot of chapters are explicitly um, intersectional, POC, queer, trans, inclusive, or um, there's just an article that came out uh, uh, like five days ago about how the majority of people who associate with Riot Girl right now are from um, from Southern America, South America, um, Central America, and like the number one city was Mexico City. Um, I think that's really amazing and. Yeah, and that's also like a, a, a story that's not talked about, and that's based on this uh, this author's research online and statistics, etc. I think it's, it's kind of easily. Oh, so do, do you want to say something since you have a blog and you do do online? Um, I don't have a lot to say about like the 
the Tumblr, oh, sorry, Tumblr feminism. I don't really know exactly what that is, but I really do like the idea of having there be um, like an online counterpart to the physical, actual, real world project that you have. Um, I think that like what you're saying about um, people like you know, out in the sticks or the booties, not being able to access zines as easily is sometimes um, remedied by making things available online. But I just definitely believe in a balance of, um, like, definitely have um, the kind of like real life counterpart to your online work and vice versa. Um, I was pretty resistant to blogging for a long time, um, mostly because I like uh, cutting dates <coughs> tonight. Um, just came from the school of thought that um, I just wanted to like give some people something that was handmade and like intimate in that way, and I didn't understand how blogs conveyed that at all. <laughs> and then I got tired of laying things out by hand for a second <laughs> and thought that blogs were awesome in the way that they're really efficient and easy. And now I just like both, and I think that they both have their place. Um, I also really like. This is kind of a tangent, I'm not answering your question. But I also like Issue U, or like things that, um, Issue U.com, like um, things that kind of like bridge that gap, um, where, okay, so Issue U is a website where you can upload the PDFs of your zine that you made by hand, and you like literally like flip the pages. It's like there's a cover, and then you click, and it flips the pages. So you kind of, it's like, you know, like kind of bridging the gap. It's kind of like a combination of both where you kind of, you know, it's like every, you scan it in and like every like fingerprint and like glue smudge is like on there. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see it and it's cool, like, but it's accessible to everyone and it's free. Uh, everyone who has internet access and it's free. Um, so there's kind of things like that that I think are kind of like uh, in between that I really love. Um, but yeah, I think that both of those things have their place and I just totally agree with Lydia, like definitely like, you know, operate in the real world as much as possible and then have the online piece be kind of a way to like disseminate your message in like a cheap and easy way for people who aren't in your town or whatever. Cool, thank you. <laughs> um, this question is about Venue. I'm specifically thinking of Narcissister, but I'm wondering about all of you. Um, so I discovered Narcissister at one of Suzanne Barch's parties like way back. And I remember between your work, which I saw quite a few times, um, I loved the, the Bloody Mary piece that you did with Marie Antoinette, uh, and also Julie Atlas Muse. I'm thinking, it's not, I don't expect to see feminist performance art in a gay bar full of shirtless gay men. So, and that you had such a big um, stage with that, I'm wondering if you could just speak about how you somehow parlayed that into the career that you have now. Um. The career I have now is quite multifaceted, and um, I like that. So I do perform a little bit in the art world. Um, I perform at performance art festivals, and I still perform quite a bit in nightclubs and um, alternative spaces. I like very much that my project is broad. I like that my work um, has the kind of content that can be read in different ways. Um, in different situations, in different framings. Um, I, I think that the fact that my work is broad presents some challenges. I think there's often misconceptions about what I do because I present it in a nightclub or because my bread and butter gig is still performing at the box. I think the art world perhaps um, misunderstands the depth um, and the complexity and the intellectualism of my project because of this. Um, however, it would never be satisfying to me to only present my work in any one arena. So I will continue to keep it as broad as possible. Uh, this is directed for OSA. Um, I'd like to just thank you so much for creating Shotgun Seamstress. Um, especially hearing your story growing up, it's very similar to mine growing up the like, only black girl in the punk scene, completely immersed in myself in music because I just really uh, relate to a lot of other people around me. Um, and I met you briefly at the uh, POZ uh, Zine Project panel in LA, I think like two years ago. 
And that's when I first found out about Jersey, and I bought it immediately and just read it. And I found out about so much. Tony Young, uh, Laura Mad Dog, I believe. Um, I've heard a rumor that he might be doing a new series of Shotgun Seamstress. I'm not sure if that's correct or not. And if it is, do you think you're going to cover more issues dealing with uh, the black community outside of music? Yes, I, oops, sorry. I totally lied and said that sh the issue six was going to be my last one. And <laughs> then I just kept making them, so now I feel stupid. <laughs> <laughs> but I made six and a half about um, Nigerian American punks, like it was like a, uh, in a, it's like a quarter size scene with four interviews. And then I did number seven about setting up shows um, in New Orleans um, under the name No More Fiction. And it was like flyers and anecdotes, which was really different because it was a lot of first person writing. Um, so again, I got to feel like a hypocrite. Um, but like the other ones are more fancy based and like interviews and that one was kind of more first person. And then I want to do a number eight. And I just decided to do it because I wanted to go to Chicago Zine Fest again because it's my favorite Zine Fest and my friends are going to be there and I wanted to reason to go. And because I said that I wasn't going to do a zine but still kept doing interviews in the meantime, I have like all this stuff to put in it. So yeah, I mean, I just, I like it. And a lot of it came from, um, I was telling, um, someone earlier that I, I'm an art teacher and I was, I've been able to share zines with kids so I like walk them through the entire process of making their own zines and they're mostly fan zines. They're mostly, they just mostly write about like what they're excited about, like Legos and Ariana Grande and Minecraft and stuff. It's really, really cute and it just like really got me stoked on fanzine writing all over again. Just the style of it, just like people writing about whatever they're excited about is such cool writing to me. So I think I kind of fell in love with it all over again and want to keep doing it. And am I, am I going to write about black people outside of music? I don't know. I haven't yet. <laughs> um, most of my interviews are with musicians. Um, I think Mark Edwards was just here. I have an interview with him on my blog. He's in a band called Cellular Chaos. Um, or was. He just quit. Um, but yeah, I think I'm just... I mean, it's like the thing that I'm most obsessed with still. Like, I go to fewer shows than I used to, but I still go to shows, I still buy records, so, yeah, that's probably what I'll keep on doing. Um, I have done issues on visual art and stuff like that. Um, I, I'll do it on whatever I'm interested in, but it'll probably mostly be a music fanzine. Cool, I'll look out for it. Thanks. Could we raise the lights on the aisles a little bit so we could see who's asking questions? Thank you. Hi, my, hi. My name is Coco Doll. Um, I'm a performance artist and also a curator. I started a curatorial last year called uh, Milk and Night. I put exhibitions together where I invite other curators to uh, create a variety of artists that are uh, dealing with uh, feminism, content, and, and dialogue. Um, I've worked with actually Nast Morse's sister and Canberra, Fowler, and uh, um, Bianca Cassadi. Um, uh, I, I created with uh, Katie Sirconi, um, uh, I, I very much relate to Astrid's uh, um, knowledge. I'm very excited to, to know about uh, your work because uh, I also am interested in uh, cost, uh, uh, um, showing a variety of uh, feminism to the public, um, the cross-generational, uh, cross-cultural, and showing the different, uh, you know, the different the media and new generation and uh, old generation together. Anyway, uh, short, uh, short thing. Um, next show is in the church um, in, the, in, in one week, actually, in 10 days. Called, uh, it's going to be called Pervasive Feminism. I co curated with uh, Justine Wahi and. Uh, What's your question? The assistant oh, of, the, of the church. Uh, I invited the pastor to do a. She's a female pastor. I invited her to uh, perform a speech. And we have also like 22 artists and speakers. I invited Laura Ray, um, who's also an independent curator. My question. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I was a question. 
is it clear? Yeah, I'm really excited about this. I've been working like for four months on this, and I really would like to invite everybody to come. It's in a beautiful church, and the content of feminism in the sacred space and the persecution is going to be addressed yeah, there. Which church is it? It's called the Lutheran Church of the Messiah. It's in Greenpoint. Um, by my colleague Park. If anyone has questions about that event, you can get up to the yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I give you flyers? That's my okay. question. Would you like? <laughs> Would you like flyers? <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay. And then you can question. come and you tell me what you think. Okay. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Um, thank you for the talk. I, it was really good. Uh, something that I've been wondering about is. Um, it seems that a central part of punk and hardcore and all of these alternative movements is the cathartic experience that you get when you're at a punk or hardcore show. And it's not that really catharsis is unique to punk or hardcore, but it's a very unique kind of catharsis. And as soon as you try to, I don't know, like break it down and sort of inject it into these other areas, it, sort of, it seems like it transforms and becomes a little bit other. And I wonder if that's something that you've had to deal with or try to reconcile and how you've been able to sort of overcome that. Does that make sense? When you, when you mean break it down into other areas, you mean outside of a, a music right, experience? Right, right, yeah. Because, I mean, I, I can't really speak for everybody, but a lot of my experience with the scene has been very small venues with like no stages and everybody's sharing equipment. And that's very special and very unique, and I think is extremely characteristic of punk and hardcore. And it's, I mean, I know that you work in a lot of alternative art spaces, but and especially the more institutionalized, like Brooklyn Museum, you know, other university galleries, it seems hard to bring that effect to people. And it almost seems like if they really wanted something like that, then they would seek it out in more traditional ways. I'm really glad you asked that question, actually. That, that's been a question that I, it's been a conversation I've had privately with a lot of people when we're putting together this show, which is, you know, punk at the Brooklyn Museum, you know, is that, does it really need to be there? What changes in punk if it's in an institution versus in, you know, a small venue? And a lot of you guys have talked about how you do much of your work in alternative spaces, places that are outside of galleries or art institutions. So uh, maybe you guys can address a little bit if, if something does change when it's in a different kind of space. I'm going to say quickly, what's interesting to me is I haven't lived in New York since 1990, but I've been coming here a lot for the last two and a half years. And I've been to at least like 20 shows that were so mind-blowing, and there were only 20 people there. I mean, all over Greenpoint, incredible bands. And I was just blown away, like, where are the fucking people? Here we are at a museum, so I guess it doesn't matter where you place it. If you can place it somewhere, people are going to come. That's, that's great. That's amazing. I'm always amazed if anybody comes to my show. But New York, a lot of New York does not support its own at this point. And if you're an alternative band, you know that. You know, it's really hard. So if, you, if people are going to come to listen to you in a museum because, you know, maybe I don't want to go to a dirty club. I can't stand death by audio. I don't like the sound there. <laughs> Here tonight, there was like 350 people, maybe 400. It's pretty amazing, and you can't get that number of people in <coughs> smaller spaces. I mean, there's, we've been, yeah, we've been talking about um, institutionalization, and, and just to clarify, with Alien She, um, the exhibition that's touring, um, the focus on that exhibition is on people who have, uh, who have gone to visual arts as their you know, as, as their career. So they're choosing to be in that setting and with the ephemera um, in, the, in the first part of the exhibition, um, the, those, the way that's framed is these are the creative out, this is the creative output of that movement. So we're not trying to like recreate or represent um, the entire, like the entirety of Riot Girl. This isn't like the history of Riot Girl. I think that history can be told in better formats than in an art exhibition. Um, this is specifically about like, the, the 
Right Girl and the creative um, part of that. Can, can I just also interject that uh, the people who have money are museums, and uh, I want all these people to be paid. You get, I mean, we, we could pay people, and, and that's a part of it too. Is trying to we're trying to use institutions to financially support people whose work we believe in, and I think that that's that's one important reason to to use those resources, as well as that it, it makes the audience broader. I mean, it, to go to a punk show. Uh, you know, a really underground punk show, you have to be the person who, we were just talking about this, who knows to go under the fence and around the corner and through the hole, you know, to get to, get to that show. Just put the place yeah. and get a lot yeah. of the clubs that are out there that are closing yeah. down and go pay 10 bucks. Right. It's simple. And here, I mean, I know a lot of people knew about this, but also we ran into people downstairs and we just told them about this event and they just walked up here and maybe people they found something here that here for they, different reasons. Yeah, that they yeah. wouldn't have encountered otherwise. perspective on um, this conversation. I like I'm very grateful that like everyone in this room is here, but at the same time I have had amazing times playing tiny shows and in intimate settings and that just means a lot to me and um, yeah, I don't know. I mean I feel like I have like I our experiences might mirror each other a little bit. Like I mean I've gone on tour and like played like a lot of small shows and been like very satisfied by that. It's exciting when you can play to a lot of people in a certain sense, but um, I don't know. I do think that like the topic and the settings are mismatched, in my opinion. Like I have, um, like we, you know, we did People Color Zine tour, and the way that we made it go, the way that we afforded, what we're able to afford to do it, was by stopping at colleges along the way. Um, because like, you know, they would pay us and then, you know, we could do like free shows or like, you know, no one turned away for lack of fun type shows um, and do those and I don't know, I mean, it served its purpose in like funding the rest of the tour, but the topic and the context always seem mismatched to me and I just feel like, I don't know, like, I'm not trying to be like famous or well known, like I'm just doing what I like to do and if people, um, and I think it's cool to like, you know, um, perform or, you know, read to people who do, do you want to like hop the fence and go under the hole and like do the whole thing. Like, I think the, that like, that kind of like digging and like will, being willing to kind of like find something off the grid is like kind of what makes it special, you know? And I don't know, I mean, I don't, this is how I feel about it, but. I don't I also disagree with that too. any of what you're yeah. saying either, but... Yeah, there's different advantages yeah. too. I agree. The different scales, different settings. I have a question actually related to that, since um, we are in an art institution, and um, the, also the title and the theme for tonight um, partly being punk and the art of feminism. So just, you know, in that whole sense, I'm really interested to hear what you guys think about the institution, the art institution and feminism in turn, and, you know, in the context of a punk perspective. Well, they're doing something different here tonight, so they're changing that right here in the here and now. So we know that institutions, for most parts, I mean, there's a male, it's male-dominated art, as is music, as is all male entertainment. But just that they're having this is at least showing some alternative here right now. I mean, and and especially the kind of exhibits that are at this museum. So an institution is just, you know, this institution or the Museum of Modern Art. If you're talking about this institution, it does seem to have a different kind of programming. And to me, wherever you can get, wherever you can communicate with people, it doesn't matter if it's in a squat or in a, in a hospital or, or in a museum, as long as you can communicate with people, I don't really care where it's at, you know? And the more places like this that do stuff like this, the more it expands the possibility. You know, I'm seeing the squats myself. Squats, it's a march. One advantage to museums, and I'm not saying that museums or institutions, big institutions are the way to go, or, or, or 
that they're all homogenous and have the same agenda or whatever. But one advantage is that beyond more money, um, there is also tech, like skilled staff that can help you realize things like technicians, designers, and other things that you might not have access to elsewhere. I just think, you know, we don't have to choose, like feminism can be in a museum and it can be in the streets and it can be on the internet and it can be in a printed fanzine and it should be in all of those places and even more places and I don't, I don't think we have anything to apologize about doing this, you know, it's great to do it in a museum, I'm really into museums and looking at art and into women um, being fully represented um, in these kinds of institutions. Um, I also just wanted to say that the idea of museums as elite spaces, I think, is false. Um, there is, like, I, does anyone have that stat about, like, how many people were, go to the Met versus a year versus, like, a sports game? In, professional sports game in New York. Anyway, it's way more and way more diverse and it's pay pay what you wish versus like, you know, something that hard, not many people can afford. Um, first of all, thank you so much. You women are all so inspiring. Um, I have a part question, part announcement, I guess. Um, I currently live in a punk house in Bushwick and I am the only girl, so uh, I'm kind of sick of it. So first of all, Females, everyone's invited. 64 Grove Street, Bushwick off the Gates J. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I've just been booking, curating shows. It's just a basement, you know, so if you feel like, you know, going through the fence, crawling into the hole kind of thing. We have shows every weekend. Um, and I've been finding more and more. It's just been, I mean, they're all amazing and I love the music, but I've been finding more and more that it's a lot of dudes moshing in the front and then like me trying not to get killed so just if you guys have had any experience with that any advice and <laughs> advice on how to maybe change shift the scene the whole way I got involved in Riot Girl was I was about to get stomped in a mosh pit and some girls came and dished me out and then gave me a bunch of zines. <laughs> so, so maybe maybe that maybe that's a formative feminist experience <laughs> that's going on in your house. Okay. And that's why I set up shows. You know, like I was a woman in a band and I saw the kind of shows that I liked to um, play. And I wanted to recreate those for people who came from my town. So that's a thing. Set up shows for any people, like kind of create the atmosphere that you want to be in. Um, hi, thanks for your talks. Um, I want to touch something that you all spoke about or whatever. Uh, Could you talk into the mic? Thanks. I hate there's a live stream of this, so there's people oh, okay. on the internet who need to hear you. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, so there's something about, uh, you know, you kind of have to be in the know. Uh, you guys brought it up, like, you have to uh, know about the zine. You have to know, you have to know about the, you know, the hole in the fence and crawl through it. And so, you know, and one aspect that kind of uh, creates like a community of freaks, like I'm weird, it's like you are weird, and that's beautiful. <laughs> but on the other hand, it sort of uh, creates like an elite of like, we're the in group, you know, you're the out group. And I just, uh, I mean, you all touched on that in different ways, and I just wonder how that affected uh, you know, your punk practice, your feminist practice, your right practice. I'm so sorry I said the thing about the hole in the Sometimes people ask me why I consider my work 
work activist, since in some ways I'm not um, out there being a radical activist in obvious ways. And I love the idea that um, there are subtle ways of being an activist, and that also includes presenting one's work, for example, in a setting such as this, or in a museum, um, other museums. Um, and I, I think that there's a way, yes, that even activism can become very pretentious, that these are people who are especially entitled to be radical and to know the ills of the world and to show us how to correct them. And um, again, I think that there are so many different ways of being punk or of being activist, and it can be just by making your art or in the way that I do and in making the art that feels important to me, that speaks about issues that um, are important to me. And um, so I think that's a way of making the work accessible, making it available to people, not only to the people who can find the hole in the fence or can decipher the zine. <laughs> um, so again, um, making my work able to live on a broad platform and to address the comment the other person asked me or question that I didn't fully answer, to edit where necessary, that I know that I can still be punk, I can still be radical, I can still be an activist um, when I edit my work so that it could live, for example, on national television. Um, so those are the ways, again, in which I, I attempt to be radical in ways that are accessible and still very strong and very potent. So let's just have one more question. You want to be the last? Hi, I have a question for Osa and Johanna, um, and it's about the archiving of zines. Um, so there's often these questions about zines versus blogs, and I haven't really heard talk, people talk about like the archiving of zines and what that means and whether that changes the medium. Um, I can say I started making zines like half decade or so ago um, because I wanted to be in a band, but I couldn't, and it just seemed like a very punk, like, just get something out there immediate, like, a very ephemeral thing, and I've noticed a trend personally of people reaching out to myself and to my friends to try to archive scenes um, in libraries, um, try to put in blogs, and I'm wondering if you think that that's a trend, if you think that archiving zines kind of changes the nature of the medium. And also, I know both of you have chosen to archive your zines. Um, Osa, you had um, your zines be published um, into a book, and I know that the Riot Girl um, anthology published your zines. Um, so I'm wondering if why you made that choice. Um, that's an interesting question, and I think about it sometimes. I think about how, um, I think the way that I, uh, like, I think that the way that I like, conceptualize zines is different than, um, like, even, like, the zines that I read when I was younger. Like, I feel like, um, and there's people who still do that now, but um, the fact that zines have been kind of way more ephemeral and how, you know, like, people made, like, just enough copies for their friends, you know, and how I, like, like sometimes I think like wow I've been making copies of like number two for eight years or whatever and how I mean I would look for zines I would look for like the first issue or second issue of a zine and like not be able to find it like a couple of years after it was out you know so I know that I'm doing it differently than other people have and I think that for me it was about making sure that people who wanted to find it could find it because I felt like it was a topic that wasn't common, you know, so um, I guess it's like a, a weird balance, like I just said, I think it's cool that you have to kind of search and find stuff, but at the same time, I think I wanted to make it as easily available to people who needed it, because I kind of saw it as like a service to myself and the like black kids and punk who found it, so I wanted to make it easier for people who needed that kind of like psychic refuge or whatever to find it. Um, I don't know if that's exactly answering your question. Uh, it's related. Well, um, flat copies of my zines are archived at the Fails Library um, alongside my personal correspondence and flyers and t-shirts and VHS tapes from the 90s. And um, for me, it was like kind of a no-brainer. I can't preserve any of this stuff on my own. 
Um, and even though I'm embarrassed of my early work, I think it's kind of um, to, um, you know, I people are interested in it, and I don't want to be responsible for every like researcher's question. So it's like kind of self-interested. Like I don't, you know, I can have enough self-esteem to, you know, say, look, I contributed something, um, and I want people to access it, but I don't want to like deal with it every day. Um, I want someone else to deal with it. And also, um, something being in an archive means it's contextualized. Like, my stuff's in the Riot Girl collection, so it's um, alongside, you know, work by my contemporaries, and there's a larger context for it, so the things that I feel stupid about, I, you know, people could say, oh, well, that was just like a thing at the time. Everyone was into unicorns or whatever. <laughs> or, you know, both sides of correspondence. Um, I, I just think it's um, cool and important, and it, it does change those scenes, but I mean, time changes those scenes. I mean, they're not of the moment, whether they're um, stored in my file cabinet at home or at the library. So um, I'm really excited that they're preserved, you know, and I, I'm really excited that your work is preserved too. Well, I could listen to these people talk all, all day and night, um, but um, uh, thanks so much to all of our panelists.